welcome back uh, so we are starting with our session uh, the partic the participants are allotted a time of 15 plus 10 minutes 15 for paper presentations and 10 minutes for question and answer so we start with the first presentation by neha ghatak and raja choudhury from cbps uh, their title is beyond the classroom a case study on the relationship between education as a public good social justice and critical pedagogy Uh, hello everyone so first of all i would like to thank the panelists and the chair and all the audience because our context has already been set so i guess if not to answer all the questions which were raised we would like to leave you with probably more questions to figure out so that's the intent right here so our presentation is titled beyond the classroom a case study on the relationship between education as a public good social justice and critical pedagogy I am Rajat, and my colleague Neha will be presenting along with me. So yeah, so it's a largely a conceptual paper. We sort of bring, we try to bring evidence from one of the action research project carried out by our team at CBPS called Bihar Mentorship Project. So we try to conceptualize the idea of public good in relation with education, and evidence it with uh, one of our study, right? So. when we think of public good especially in relation with education it is seen as a transformative force and once anything is seen as a transformative force the state's responsibility is sort of attached to it that state should be the provider of it right so here we are at a juncture where we also see in the contemporary education system that there is a shrinking role of state right because the state is right now at the back foot when it comes to providing the education so the idea of public good sort of stands challenged in so many ways so we so in this paper we try to prob problematize the idea of public education as a public good uh, especially we borrow the de uh, definition from the discipline of economics and try to see what what then can become the critical elements of public good especially in relation to education right so yeah so we start with setting up the discourse on education as a public good so as professor dhankar already said that if you look at the economic definition of public good it's largely contingent on two principles right that it being a non rivalrous good in uh, nature and non excludable as well what does non rivalrous means is basically the consumption by one doesn't lead to you know reduction in consumption by other right and it should be available to everyone right but again like i said in the start if i juxtapose this with the contemporary education system it stands a little bit challenged because as the rise of human capital theory we see there is a focus on individual returns right and that sort of changed the entire education system because now there is a focus on maximization of economic gains and there are another performative measures which are attached like ranking system cost reductions and so forth right so it being non rivalrous in nature and non excludable again stands challenged right and then there are other uh, critics scholars who argue that if the state is the only provider of education it might lead to a, a, a situation where there is over regulation of re uh, education right and it might create a situation where there is a homogenized idea of education right and then education again can be used as a political tool as a propaganda tool so there are con contradictions and tensions when we think of public good and education and try to juxtapose these concepts so what we are trying to do here is we are picking up argument given by broom that the idea of public good is not just based on certain principles but rather it's an imaginary space a space which is constructed through discussions and the process of it the actions and the belief which are attached to that idea which remains imagined but in process we we as neha will explain you in the further slides that what are the elements which can be used as a practice to establish this nature right so we argue that the the element of social justice should be right at the center of imagining education as a public good so when we talk about social justice we are looking at the redistributive nature of social justice and the another approach which we can think of is the humanistic idea of education which attach the element of dignity uh, with the ultimate goal of education yeah. so one another way to look at it is through the policies over the period of time 
if you look at different Indian like pol educational policies in the context of India, you will find that the element of social justice has always been at the center, at the core, ranging from the constitution, from the till the uh, very recent iteration of education policy, which is NEP 2020. But then the question remains: Why do we see such large-scale inequalities, right? Because if the concept of social justice is at the center and still we see inequalities, there is something which is lacking in the practice. That element is that the idea of social justice is not defined and its elements are not articulated uh, and the processes are not articulated and in return not uh, actualized, right? So yeah, moving forward, the another, another uh, way to look at education right now is to look at the privatization. I won't go into the nitty gritties how, of how privatization on, in education in India exists, but one critical argument we are making here that here is that privatization is not a homogenized idea, right? When it comes to education, there are multiple phases of uh, privatization which we see, especially in case of India, right? There are for-profit uh, organization which are providing education, then you have NGOs, then you have you know, non-for-profit organizations and all other kind of actors who are delivering education right now. And then there are other phases of uh, privatization of education like shadow privatization, which probably doesn't exist in many other countries, which is very particular here in this context. So what, what that leaves us with is that the privatization, the conceptualization is not inherently bad, but needs to be sort of unlayered once again, because the idea is, for-profit organizations and the way they are providing education leads to a certain ghettoization of education, right? Because even if they extend choices to multiple people and availability is enhanced and extended, the choices are again limited to a certain class of people, right? So we argue that the idea of social justice should become a critical element of any public good, especially in the case of education. And Neha will provide you evidences that how in the social justice argument, what could actually become a part of practice and what could be the tool to deliver it? And then how can we actualize the idea of social justice, uh, social justice and then you know, linking it with the idea of public good and education? Yeah, over to you. Thank you, Rajat. So uh, we are going to talk a little bit about how critical pedagogy can s be seen as a mechanism or a tool through which you know the idea that social justice is at the core of education as a public good can be realized. And uh, right now we'll briefly talk a little bit about critical pedagogy and social justice, and then I'll move on to giving examples about how in Bihar Mentorship Project, we actually saw uh, use of critical pedagogy through various forms, and the uh, little bit of impact that we could see on two critical elements uh, like caste and gender, which are at the core of social justice in India. So that, that's why critical pedagogy then becomes relevant, because as we've uh, heard our speakers in the morning, and Rajat also explained, that increasingly what is happening in our country is that only a particular class and caste of people uh, go to government schools, whereas only a particular class goes to for-profit private schools. Um, so social justice, as you know, is a multifaceted concept and there is not one clear definition of social justice that exists. And it has been conceptualized differently uh, by a lot of people, but there are certain key elements in the idea of social justice, right? And the idea of jo social justice is embedded in redressing and addressing not just current form of inequality, but also to understand the systemic dis uh, discrimination, historical discrimination and oppression that happens. So um, in simple words, it could be seen as something which delivers the greatest benefit to the least advantage. And that is also connected to Amartya Sen's idea of uh, capabilities that one must enhance capabilities and reduce unfreedoms of the least privileged in the country. So taking these as the main theory of social justice, we move forward to see how critical pedagogy can fit into this framework. So um, critical pedagogy, as we know, is a concept that was developed by Ferrer, and then it was taken forward by other pedagogues. 
and um, social justice in education therefore then creates an environment of equity, inclusion, and respect for diversity. And uh, critical pedagogy then challenges hegemonic norms and the structure and empowers learners to become agents of their own social change. Uh, so it is rooted in a student-centered practice it is rooted in culturally responsive learning environments and a collaborative space and a safe space for learners and teachers to come together and co-create the kind of knowledge that is generated in that classroom space or outside the classroom also. So there are three elements of critical pedagogy that we have taken here. One is dialogue. So dialogue is rooted in the idea of a dialogical classroom where students are not just seen as mere recipients of knowledge, but they also equally participate to decide what kind of knowledge they want to be, uh, you know, they want and how they take the knowledge further. So it's typically a classroom where the teacher talks less and the students talk more. And critical reflection is linked to dialogue because it's a method of uh, critical inquiry and self-examination. And the last element that we take over here is of praxis. And praxis is also linked to dialogue and critical reflection because in one word, if I have to define praxis, then it is action that is driven from dialogue and driven from critical reflection. So now we talk about the Bihar Mentorship Project and then we see how these three elements of um, dialogue, critical reflection, and praxis can be seen embedded in the approach that we had to this Bihar Mentorship Project. So before I go into that, I'll talk a little bit about what this project was all about, and it's a very interesting project. So this is a mentorship, uh, an em empowerment-based mentoring model that we developed for adolescent boys and girls. So it was located in 10 government schools of Bihar, uh, Muzaffarpur and Patna, five schools each, one in peri-urban uh, Patna that, uh, and one in the rural parts of Muzaffarpur. So um, the action research, the components of the action research composed of in-class modules where we had mentors delivering these modules to children who were studying in class six, seven, and eight in these schools regularly. And teacher training was also an important component of this PMP project. Community uh, relationship building with communities was also a critical element. And one very interesting intervention that was done during the COVID time, which was called learning through letters. I'll talk a little bit more in details when I move on to my other slides. Um, how was research and action then integrated into BMP because it's an action research? So in research, we followed a mixed practice. So we did our typical baseline, endline surveys, but along with that, there was a huge qualitative component also in this. So I will take seven. <laughs> and action and research went hand in hand in this project because um, it was, uh, so the action was always informed by the research. So because the research was ongoing through a qualitative process and also the quantitative data that was coming in, nothing was pre-decided at the beginning. So our modules were not decided and the objectives of the modules were not decided right at the beginning. But then we looked at the data, we spoke to the students, we figured out what they want to learn and what is the need for you know, what is their need, how do they articulate their need, and facilitated that process. Um, and it was a very deliberate choice to work in non-residential government schools, because the idea was to work with first generation learners, uh, to work with children who were from marginalized sections, and to work in schools that were resource deprived. So that, uh, you know, if we could demonstrate certain impact or even understand the process of change that we were trying to foster, then, and if it worked in a typical government school in the country, then it has implications for other schools also to take up. So this was BMP. Now we will talk about the framework of mentorship, which was integral to the BMP project and how it is linked to critical pedagogy. So as you can see, mentorship is, uh, you know, an interactive process and it's based on the equal exchange of ideas and rooted in a dialogical classroom, like I have explained before. So we encouraged a lot of, you know, discussions, collaborative work, debates, arguments within the classroom space. And 
community relationships were very critical to establish this mentoring practice because the idea was that our mentors can't work on this until unless they understand the contexts of the children. So they had to do, uh, you know, visit the communities regularly, be in touch with the students, talk to their parents and family members. Um, mentorship, again, was not seen as opposed to teaching because we wanted teachers to be our allies and we wanted teachers to pick up some of these mentorship practices in their classroom processes. And that actually helped because here is a quote from one of the government school teachers in Patna who said that my ideal classroom is the one where students speak the most and the teacher speaks the less, least actually. Now about the in-class modules. So we had mainly three in-class modules. Uh, one, the first one was on communication and enhancement of communication skills. And the second one was on knowledge and caste. And the third one was on gender. We couldn't implement the gender module because of COVID. Instead of that, we did the learning through letters initiative. But let me talk a little bit about the communication module and why the communication module. So we thought that if it has to be a dialogical classroom, and as we all know, that our general classroom processes don't encourage that. So students are not used to talking in the classroom. Students are used mainly to listening to what the teacher is saying. So if we had to encourage that, students had to know themselves, be comfortable with their peers, uh, you know, talk more to their peers, know more about them, and also then, uh, you know, move on to understanding what communication is. So there was a gradual progression that we had. So the first activities that we did with children were simple games that we played with children so that they understood, they worked together in collaboration. They also spoke more in classrooms. So we encouraged that kind of conversation in the classrooms. Then we moved to more complex things like, you know, what are the different aspects of communication? So what, why? How is context relevant to communication and things like that? Um, a simple example of this was that we encouraged children to, one of the first activities in this was we encouraged children to do uh, interviews with their own teachers so that they got to know better. Questions were framed by the mentors and the teachers together, uh, mentors and the children together. They went, they interviewed the teachers, then they were allowed to self-reflect on it in terms of what questions did you ask, how did the teachers respond to those questions, and in the end they were allowed to reflect and then express uh, what they felt about, uh, you know, this uh, communication that they had with the teachers. And this could have been done through various ways. So expression was also not limited to just writing or drawing about it. It actually depended on the children in terms of how they wanted to express. An expression of emotion was also central to how we framed the idea of communication in a dialogical BMP classroom. The second module was on caste and knowledge systems because we thought that for children to understand what caste was all about and what the hegemony of knowledge, how it is related to caste, they really need to uh, you know, before they start questioning, they had to understand this. They un had to understand the structural hegemonic dimensions of caste and how it is connected to knowledge. And that's why this module. And this module started with very simple activities in terms of understanding how do we receive knowledge and how do we think about knowledge, how knowledge is connected to certain identities. So who has knowledge and who doesn't have knowledge and question, the, and question that and ask why. So this actually culminated in, and there were various activities that we have mentioned here. So we started with talking about stereotypes, what is fact, what is opinion. So the idea of you know rationality and all those things were embedded in this. Um, and scientific temperament actually, that was also, but scientific temperament that was connected to the kind of oppressive structures that we work around. So, you know, that's how knowledge and caste came together through these modules. And uh, one example that uh, I can say that what we did in this was, in the end, we asked children to do a play on, okay, uh, to do a play on caste. And it was an open-ended play, which the children worked on. So they had to decide what the ending of the play was. And they were allowed to reflect, create that play, and present it in front of all their peers and teachers. Now, this is one of the main pedagogical practices that we followed, and this is connected to critical pedagogy, 
this is erac we call it iraq uh, so it's experience reflection action and consolidation so this is how all classes were structured even our learning through letters was structured accordingly and i don't have time to go into the details of this but we can continue this conversation when we discuss more this was learning through letters learning through letters was our intervention around covid so research that we were doing had told us that children had the least access in our schools to technology and girls even less so how do we reach them and we thought that the best way to reach them was through sending letters so these were letters that were in the form of learning materials that we sent them and this also was embedded in critical pedagogy because it uh, because even though self learning was a component to which we had to orient the children at the beginning we tried uh, you know inculcating ideas of dialogues and discussions with family members with the peers and whoever was around them around that time um so that not just we could continue our engagement with children but also you know deal with the kind of learning losses that the children were facing around that time and uh, you know there was also a response card that would go it was a pre uh, stamped card and children could write back to us because we thought that it can't be a one way process of us sending learning materials to children so and a lot of children actually responded with different drawings and poems and just by writing thank you to us so impact now uh, uh i'm not saying that you know we changed their entire perspective on gender and caste but we managed to do a little bit um impact could be seen in the way children thought about masculinity femininity and the social norms around it here is one example that i have given um about you know example about wearing lipstick and how girls in a classroom debated the idea of wearing lipstick and you know few were opposed and few were for and it showed that you know girls were thinking through the process and um other visible impact was seen through our baseline and endline surveys where we saw that uh, typical stereotypical hegemonic ideas of you know that only fair is beautiful or understanding of menstrual taboos to superstitions gendered role and also stereotypical occupational choices so their attitudes towards these things we could see a clear shift especially on the girls and we also saw that there were a lot of girls through informal conversations with us expressed the need to delay their marriages and um, we also saw some impact on caste where we saw that uh, you know uh, that children had changed their attitudes towards that they had the freedom to marry irrespective of caste although a lot of girls still believed that you know it wasn't possible and it was a very ideal concept and they actually didn't have that kind of freedom but there was significant shift where we uh, where we uh, in which we saw that their attitudes towards the practice of untouchability and knowledge and caste had shown shifts so in conclusion uh, bmp does hit hint towards how critical pedagogy is a powerful tool um, to see how positive change can be brought about in the lives of children and their perspectives and it is significant because it has been implemented in government schools and the changes in the attitudes of girls is of particular significance to us because we all know that that has intergenerational impact um also that education that is transformative and emancipatory does have high very high social returns and that is central to the idea of education as a public good Mm, and bmp is just one of the examples we have many other examples from india as you can see i've listed some of them here um and like rajat was explaining that the role of private so when we think about education as a public good we tend to focus only on the state but in our country because private is a huge part of our education system it's important to bring the private also into the purview otherwise you know social justice in education does not hold meaning So yeah that's it thank you so much thank you so since you know so we have four papers actually in in this uh, session this was the first one and uh, they are not necessarily very like it's not that you know we can so there are two ways one is that we just do the four papers first and then do the discussion that will save time so should we go for that huh should we go for that rohit 
ठीक है तो देन यू बिकॉज अदरवाइज एंड वी विल देन या सो द सेकेंड प्रेजेंटेशन इज़ बाई भावना परमार शी इज़ अ डिज़ाइन रिसर्चर एंड हर टॉपिक इज़ रिटेनिंग इन इक्वालिटीज एम्पेरिकल इंसाइट्स फ्राम झारखंड ऑन द डेली नेगोसिएशन ऑफ लर्नर्स फ्राम मार्जिनलाइज ट्राइब्स you should use the same computer otherwise it will become very difficult they are changing all this she's made her notes here no so that will make it difficult i am no they will find it difficult the sound system and all i will use that or oh, so you will use your notes fine that's okay is that okay i am we will have to fix <laughs> Hi everyone I am Bhavna I am from Quest Alliance I am a design researcher and this project as uh, she said is about retaining inequalities and empirical insights from Jharkhand on the daily negotiations of learners from marginalized tribes So um this paper basically was conceptualized during an ongoing project that we're doing in Jharkhand where we're trying to see what kind of stories the, le- the learners want to tell instead of just imposing themes on them that the that the organization works on so this paper aims to bring a grounds up perspective on how education is being inst- experienced by students from marginalized tribes in Jharkhand through the case study of a Santhali 8th grader called Ruben and as the previous uh, presentation also spoke about the idea of social justice in education this this presentation or this paper is trying to oh sorry this presentation uh, and the paper is trying to show that uh, so the idea of social justice justice is completely divorced from how education is experienced on the ground in jharkhand by marginalized tri- uh, marginalized tribe students so keeping the story of ruben at the center it focuses on the navigations and negotiations that marginalized students go through at home and school to keep themselves in the education system this is a qualitative approach and it will just take one case study in depth mm. yeah yeah this is not as easy as that as i thought it would be anyway so uh basically about ruben uh, i didn't want to use his face but that is ruben drawing there on the left so uh, ruben is a 13 year old santhali boy in 8th grade in the in a primary school in a place called thanda dumaria in dumka jharkhand thanda dumaria is a predominantly santhali village which comes under the schedule 5 district of our country when he was asked to uh, draw how he sees himself he well, i think i have it in the next slide so he drew uh, himself as a man holding the indian flag and he said he wants to be in he wants to join the army he his aspirations are to sorry can i just is this better eating away <laughs> my time okay yeah so his aspiration was join to join the army and he said that he wants to uh, be of service to the nation this is something that a lot of boys in government schools say and when we asked to when we asked him to list down five characteristics as to how he def- would define himself he noted down many things one of them was hum gareeb hain which was very matter of factly said so but he has put this drawing of a bike in his school and he looks at it whenever he goes to the school and this sort of reminds him the kind of life he wants to picture for himself in the future uh but he says like between between the expectations at home and expectations at school he finds it difficult to actually learn and attain the skills he would need to reach his goals and feels that he won't be able to stay in school for long he said zyada to nahi pad payenge lagta hai he is an ace right now he he doesn't he can't imagine going to 12th at at this moment so basically about jharkhand um jharkhand's literacy rate is 67.60% and uh, the the gross enrollment ratio at primary level is 106.0% and but it drops considerably when you go to the higher secondary level which is 37.9% mm when we look at 
so basically this paper is trying to see what are the negotiations that students face at home and how they are brought to the school system and how the school system sort of ignores all the inequalities that the students have and treats them as equals in the, in a school environment and due to that it does a huge disservice to the students so basically the negoti negotiations at home that he, schools and learning often become secondary to everything that needs to be done for the students families to get through the to get through to the next day of which the children are a necessary extra pair of helpful hands Waking up at 4 a.m. every day, many of the boys and girls from tribal communities like Reuben go to the farm to go to their own farm to help their parents with their land. Girls also do additional household chores, and once they're done with the work, around eight or nine, they go back home and get ready. So Reuben says that I don't think I'll be able to study much because my father doesn't let me go to school if I don't finish my work at the farm. And he says education has its own place, but. I have to farm for the rest of my life, so might as well learn this better. I don't need to go to the school every day. Uh, when we look at the family of Reuben, Reuben's family survives on meager wages. His father is a mystery who has studied till fifth grade and manages to earn 200 to 300 rupees depending on what, the kind of work he gets. Along with his father, he also has a brother-in-law who lives with him. He has two siblings, one elder si sister, a younger sister. The elder sister is married. So the brother-in-law stays with him and he also works as a mystery, does the same work. Um, Ruben's mother was an earning member of, member of the family as well, but, but, as well, but she passed away because of which the uh, onus of earning for the family also fell on Ruben. So to take, to uh, depay the share of loans, take care of medical bills, uh, all of this Ruben also had to manage. Uh, and around this time the pandemic also came, so his, uh, for, because the education went online, his brother-in-law would take him to the brick mill to get him to work there and earn for the family. So Ruben, apart from working for the family, also uh, collected 7,500 rupees and bought himself a phone, co-bought a phone with a friend on which now he buys, uh, on which now he sees, watches Santhali videos very proudly. Um, so the idea that either school or child labor is something that the students select, it's not really true because labor is sort of interspersed with how they uh, experience education as well. And when uh, when asked when uh, we asked Ruben what what does he prioritize in life, he said that his first and foremost idea is to help his parents and education on the, came really low at the list because he, he had a sense of responsibility towards his parents first. Um, apart from working for earning the family, a lot of Santali families own their own land and they work on the land uh, on their own. Every member of the family has, has something that they have to do. So Ruben's family uh, owns 1.5 acres of land where they go at 4 a.m. every day. Ruben is in charge of plowing and weeding, whereas his sisters are in charge of paddy transpl transplantation, cutting and collecting. After he's done with this is only when he can go to the school, get ready and go to the school. During the harvesting time of June and October, almost all the students, including Ruben, cannot go to school for months on end. But the teachers know this, but the onus of catching up with the lesson falls on students like Ruben. Mm, Ruben actually does not really like working on uh, on farm, but he knows that he cannot really say no. He says that there are insect bites and uh, the work is very strenuous, but uh, he feels a sense of responsibility towards his parents and does not think that he can say no. But even, even when it gets a little too much, he rebels and runs away from home. And his, if he doesn't do the work, his dad sort of tells him that, um, you'll not get food or you'll not get to go to school. So these sort of threats are also given to him. He can still afford to rebel and run away, which is not something, which is not a privilege that is afforded to girls. Um, girls are less likely to rebel against their parents' wishes. Like a girl from sixth grade told us that she loves doing farm work and if given a choice between farm and school, she would gladly choose farm because that's what her parents uh, want her to choose. And apart from work, which is something that the boys are asked to do, girls, for girls, as was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation as well, get married after eight. And this is a common knowledge in th Thunder to Maria that this primary school ends at eight, so the next school is 12 kilometers away. So a lot of girls do not enroll in that. They get married. Uh, 
there were 18 girls in class 8 out of which 5 had already uh, had boys uh, families knock at their doors for marriage and when we even though they were initially saying that no no my parents will get me married by 18 but uh, we spent some time with them and that's how these things came out we also found that a teacher's relative went to see a, do a, a, a girl for marriage um so looking at all of this we realized that uh, parents look at the when ruben's father says that he should work instead of taking education seriously or when girls parents put more weight on housework or farm work they're showing their implicit reservations about the school sending their children to school becomes a futile exercise when they could help the fa family financially or in the farm parents weigh the options and sometimes decide to avoid the direct or opportunity costs associated with gaining school certificates that often time will be useless because they see many people around them who have not been able to use their degrees and are still doing daily wage labor this has also been found on a study with the oravan community of chatisgarh by peggy frower another thing that we found was also that ruben has aspirations of going to the army but his family does not know that ruben thinks that if he tells uh his family that there'll be an added burden so he keeps it away from his family so expectations and responsibilities at home result in a daily negotiation between the parents and the students and the students routinely find themselves on the losing side parents give precedence to the immediate need of the household rather than a long term investment in their children's education which not to say that parents are at fault this is how their uh, material realities are now when students so students look at school as a refuge uh, from home from the responsibilities of the home so ruben also treats the school as a refuge away from home he sees the school as a space for socialization where he can be away from the family responsibilities for some time and be with his friends he recognizes the potential of education in reaching his aspirations and wishes to learn english and math but he struggles to write even coherent sentences in hindi and has issues with elementary math like division and multiplication is something that he cannot do at all uh so this ruben school uh, is divided into two floors the upper primary is on the first floor the lower primary is on the ground floor there are six teachers for 250 students three teachers are for upper primary three for lower and one teacher is uh, absent more or less all the time and one is a permanent teacher apart from that five teachers are contract teachers so the students told us that uh ruben told us that uh, teachers don't even climb the first floor for days on end on only on one day in a week they will come just give students class work class work entails just writing what is written in the book or mugging up question answers or just practicing writing or reading so uh but the teachers explain it away saying that we have to manage multiple classes at once and we're not able to fo uh, give focused attention to any of any of the classes and we do our best on top of this they say that they have many administrative duties which keeps them away from school for long amounts of time and like for example one math teacher also has a shop in the in the village where he so, so he sort of divides his time between the school and the shop and the shop obviously takes precedence because it gives more money um ruben also uh, told us that even when students are at home oh sorry teachers are in the classroom in the school they come give class work and more often they go out and spend time on phones or talking because teaching is not as uh, given that much precedence so, so even if we sorry even if we want to look at uh administrative duties or lack or a skewed pupil teacher ratio we also have to see that uh there are other things happening in this school so even when teachers are present in the classroom they do not strive for excellence but for minimum level performance from the students this is something that velaskar uh, padma velaskar also talks about teachers are satisfied with imparting bare minimum knowledge to the students which they explain away by pinning it on the incapabilities exhibited by these students so these students here refers to students from marginalized castes and tribes which in the view of the teachers are cognitively less capable to grasp the concepts designated for the learning levels for their standard a uh, science teacher in the school nilambar mishra said that they don't have enough brains to work hard and reach beyond labor work all the smart ki kids are in private schools we get students who are less capable so it will be unfair to expect them to reach the same heights as students from private school uh bodo also talks about the ideology of giftedness in the cornerstone of the education system as it persuades those at the margin 
that their social fate is a product of their individual nature and teachers hence are satisfied saying that this is because they're not capable enough to learn. So the sense of responsibility and duties towards the students get skewed with the teachers feel when the teachers feel that the students lack capabilities to match up to their privileged private school going counterparts. Um, so to, uh, as knowledge and growth takes a backseat, discipline in the form of corporal punishment comes to the forefront. Uh, limited or lack of knowledge transfer is substituted with imparting discipline which the teachers make their primary objective. Uh, Ruben tells us that Nilambar Sar and Mithun Sar, both upper caste uh, professors um, uh, who teach math and science, beat up many students. And he says that they beat us, beat us more than teach us. Uh, he recounts of one uh, instance where uh, one, when he was in first grade, a student of eighth grade was beaten so bad that he urinated his pants and the next day he stopped coming to school. Um, so another thing that we found that teachers, when spoke, when we asked what impacts Corona or the COVID had on the students, they said that the biggest drawback was that now the students are not standing for national anthem and they don't know how to behave. The discipline has gone away and that is the worst that we have seen. So this also says, shows their uh, inherent biases and the othering that they hold towards the students who are from marginalized backgrounds. The parents, uh, the teachers know that they ha the uh, parents are from are fighting for sustenance. There's a lot of the, they have to go for daily wage labor. But instead of understanding the the background of the realities, the contextual realities that the students come from, teachers are quick to blame the parents for the students' disinterest in education and hold them responsible for the learning gaps of students. Uh, they say that you know the, their parents don't support them and their parents are not learned enough or their all of uh, all the blame just goes on the parents and saying that the parents do not see the they are from this community and things like that so it sort of is put on how they think education is or the community knowledge that the parents hold so instead of extending a helping hand or an understanding not teachers are known to dangle the fear of issuing a transfer certificate in front of the students if they witness absenteeism i have wanted to put a picture of the absent uh, markings that the teachers do so if a student is absent for two weeks at an at an end so the teachers uh, bring the school uh, bring the student to school and uh, tells them beats them, tells them that, you know, you have to keep continuing or we'll give you a transfer circuit certificate, you'll be out of this school and you'll go and work for the rest of your life. So it's a lot of fear that's, in, that's been instilled. And anyway, students have a lot of uh, fear and uh, responsibilities at home. So they feel really isolated and they feel that nobody, no, none of the adults actually understand them in the system. Uh, so when Ruben was uh, absent for a month in the harvesting season, the teacher did the same thing and he was very scared because he didn't know how to tell his father that he's been asked to go to school and he didn't know how to tell the teacher that he has to stay at home. So he sort of negotiated on his own that one day he'll go to the school and for the rest of the days he'll go to the farm to work. Um, yeah, so basically teachers inherent bias focus on discipline and half-hearted attempts at teaching put tribal students at a disadvantage. Teachers being the personification of the education system for the students fail to understand, empathize, and make space for the lived realities of tribal students like Ruben. So um, if we look at students' aspiration, a lot of teachers say that the students only don't want to. Yeah, it's ending, it's the last two slides. So, uh, Students themselves, a lot of teachers say, this is a common discourse that you hear when you talk to adults in the education system where they say that uh, students themselves don't want to study, they don't have interest in education. But the truth is that students want to study, they, they have aspirations of social mobility, they want to get out of their, the vicious cycle of poverty and inequalities that they are in, but they do not have an example to look up to. They do not have a system that they can see where they know that, yeah, we will get out of it. So like Ruben's students of his classroom have aspirations of becoming a teacher, an army officer, or a nurse. But when asked what steps would you take to have, to take to reach, what steps would you take to reach there? They were not able to decipher what would it take for them to reach their aspirations. Uh, and where, so we had given the students an exercise where we, we asked them, what steps would you take to, re to 
to become a doctor. The students were dumbfounded. They did not know how can someone become a doctor. But when we asked them, how do you think a child like you can uh, land up in mine work? they had elaborate steps of telling us that you know this is the role of the teachers this is the role of the parents this is the role of the community that uh, maybe there'll be death of my parents maybe there'll be a medical emergency maybe there'll be the teachers will there'll be no teaching at school so we'll not be able to perform an examinations so they had elaborate like steps as to how they'll reach in mind work because they have seen their peers do that um, so Ruben drew up a plan for himself for pursuing a career in teaching. After pondering on the financial requirements uh, that becoming a teacher entails, he declared he will have to work every morning from 4 to 12 to earn money, after which he will have to go to school and then go back home to help his parents with farm work. He will have to buy better books for secondary school if he has to perform better, which would cost a lot, and he will ha also have to go take tuitions as well to prepare for the exams. After making the plan, he says, kuch to kar lenge, realizing that the plan is unsustainable and he will not be able to follow through. So um, with the focus of the family on making ends meet, students imagine schools as spaces of refuge, but with the bias of teachers and the inherent othering they face, isolates them from considering schools as spaces of belonging, growing, and learning. Schools being perceived as no uh, spaces to gain knowledge is a privilege only afforded by a few, which does not reach the students of tribal backgrounds like Ruben. Struggling to find autonomy and rest understanding at home as well as the school, students gradually get nudged away from the system, from the education system. They perpetually find themselves only one misfortune away from dropping out and hence are always in a hypervigilant state when in school. The onus to negotiate their right to education at home and school lies squarely with them. Uh, their negotiations at home find no space in the education system and they're sort of othered on the basis of that only and they feel like they're fighting an already lost battle um, and they will not be able to fulfill their dreams I would just um, sorry by not recognizing the lived and material realities of tribal students the education system ends up othering them by asserting that to access the education system they will have to leave their identities outside uh, class and tribe Tribal, the onus hence to fight the systemic inequalities becomes a personal and familial struggle there which finds no space in the education system. This is corroborated by Bordeaux saying that to penalize the underprivileged and favor the most privileged, the school only has to neglect in its teaching methods and techniques and its criteria when making academic judgments to take into account the cultural inequalities be between children of different classes. In other words, by treating its pu pupil how unequal they may be in reality, as equal in rights and duties, the education system is led to give its de facto sanction to initial cultural inequalities. The formal e equality which governs pedagogical practices is in fact a cloak for and a justification of indifference to the real inequalities. So th with that I'll end. Uh, thank you, Bhavna. Next up we have Priya Singh and Vikas John. They are affiliated to the Indian Institute of Human Settlement. Uh, their topic is alumni experiences in planning education and beyond. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Priya Singh. I'm a researcher at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Uh, this paper, while I'll be the one presenting our paper, our plan is studying the planning, the envisioned alumni experiences in planning education and beyond, was written by me and my colleague Vikas John. Uh, in this presentation, we will put forward the reflections and findings from our work on students and alumni trajectories within Work Package 5 of the No GCRF project. Our work is built on the premise that lived experiences and the actions they impel are important in understanding how practice is engendered. And in doing so, our work hopes to shed light on the ways in which the ideals of equity and equality are made sense of through the voices of our participating alumni from leading planning sites. Uh, these voices emerge from their experiences, uh, also informs us of their expectations from the planning discipline and if those were fulfilled. 
the paper takes a self-reflexive approach to the practice of research. The main points of inquiry are quality of entities, processes, and meaning, which we investigate through semi-structured interviews with respondents over a period of time. We use both narrative methodology and reflexive methodology. Since our study was a human-centered one, which focused on elements of experience that have had a sincere impact on our respondents, a narrative storytelling approach offered a way to understand those experiences and also provide an avenue for exploring the social, cultural, and institutional narratives within which those individual experiences were constituted. Uh, adopting reflexive methodology allowed us to not only analyze stories that are participants about our part participants' lives, but also analyze why, what they decided to tell stories about. And by looking at how they articulated the stories they shared on the basis of the self-questioning of the story, the meaning-making me meaning process uh, was supported through a generative and multi-led process of reflexive interpretation. Now, the study is situated in four important locations of planning education, which were RD University in Tanzania, Chula Longon and Thammasat University in Thailand, University of Moratova in Sri Lanka, School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi, and IHS in Bangalore. But our uh, study was India outwards, and the institutions and alumni from other nations, all of which were in the global south, play the role of exploratory and indicative widgets, serving the purpose of comparison rather than being sites of in-depth analysis themselves. Also, looking at multiple locations allows us to investigate the site-specific phenomena that influence the target group's e engagement with values of equity and equality. And it also allows us to expand on the translocal conversation as we move forward with this study. A brief history of planning education in India. So in India, planning education picked a pace relatively late. Studying cities and their processes and activities in an academic capacity is of recent origin. And it was only in the last few decades after the neoliberalism principles came into play and cities were recognized as the drivers and hubs for economic growth that a shift in the public discourse for urban issues and problems occurred. But the planner that these planning courses tried to churn out remained mostly a technocrat who had more technical than practical knowledge and understanding, and thus they were mostly unable to come up with socially relevant plans. The holistic understanding of the urban and its needs, which required for collaborative planning, was mostly missing from the subject matter of the education that these planners were receiving. These shifts in the curriculum occurred rather late. So given these precedent structural points in the evolution of planning education and their critiques, it becomes important to look at the existing understanding of educational trajectories through a socio-cultural lens. Thus, we look at the idea of practice being informed by experience. Now, when we look at the idea of practice being informed by experience, we speak of a very specific type of it, which is the student experience. Our research looks at the student and alumni experiences and the consequent articulations of practice, and we examine them at the intersections of discipline-driven imperatives, the curriculum that they studied, and the social dynamics that existed at the sites of education and of practice. Now, in the existing literature, there is an embedded understanding that the nature and relation between students, alumni, and trajectories is rather structured and linear. But, our interactions, but in our interactions, we saw that that was not always the case, and our respondents' own narratives and uh, uh, history supported and constructed their positionalities. In the following slides, we will share with you snippets from our conversations with our participants. Uh, now, when we look at discipline as a point of analysis, we look at the motivations that brought our participants into the field, into planning, and these motivations were carved out by different factors, which were discourse surrounding planning education, the strategic choices and decision making they had to do, and the social capital that they possessed. Now, how respondents, uh, consciously or unconsciously, talked about the discipline in different settings and under different circumstances spoke on multiple levels of the positionality of planning discipline. These are some excerpts that show uh, uh, from our interactions which hint at the discourse surrounding planning education. Since all our respondents belong to a societal structure in which an education in the sciences was valued more than an education in any other discipline, discourse led to a lot of accidental trajectories in planning, especially in India, where to get into a planning institute, you give the same exam you give to get into an engineering institute. So a lot of the participants ended up in planning education after failing to get into an engineering choice institute of their choice. 
uh, we also observed an interplay between choice of institution and that of the course. This spoke of the strategic decision making that our participants undertook. While most of them enrolled in planning courses because of the value a degree from the institution held, some did consciously enroll for the course rather than the credential, but it wasn't a 50-50 case in our study. Uh, for most, most of the students, the tag that the institution carried had a, was a much bigger motivator than the course itself. Now, all institutions that we selected in our study has, is somewhat uh, an, of an elite institution in their respective geographies, which led, them, which, uh, led to them commanding a certain stature, uh, which it also extended to its alumni. And the role this stature played was what brought most of these participants into these institutions. Uh, now, when we speak of social capital, we refer to the relationships and networks which an individual has. And it was observed that the respondents who consciously did uh, want to come into planning had someone in their lives to nudge them towards it. For some, it was a professional connection and for some, it was a personal one. And these are some quotes that our participants spoke of when speaking of what, uh, which social capital led them into the course of plan, into planning curriculum. Now, curriculum itself is an inherently value-laden process, and it's a very contested space. Examining student experiences and engaging with such a curriculum is an important thread of inquiry, as literature has shown that curriculum can be an instrument of ideology, exerting power through the reproductive process where dominant relations are propagated and reproduced. These are some snippets that speak to it uh, about how our alumni engaged with their, uh, how, how these alumni engage with their curriculum. But it's not always the black and white curriculum that shapes student experience. The transaction of the curriculum between faculty and students and the larger social structures play an equally important role. So the role of the curriculum in the margins was also something which became very important to analyze. These excerpts show that the curriculum can or cannot inspire someone, but other impulses which happen outside the classroom or in the society has a much bigger role to play in the kind of planner one would end up becoming after going through the same black and white curriculum. Uh, now, education and professional spaces are essentially figured worlds where class, caste, and gender work as critical pivots on which imagined figurative identity and the positional relation identities entangle. And this leads to a negotiated space of authoring and making of worlds. In, uh, due to the sensitivity, sensitivity surrounding concepts of caste and gender, what we did was we discussed them at the cohort level rather than at the individual level. So when our participants spoke of experiences with caste, they spoke of how the cohort reacted to students belonging to certain caste uh, 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 rather than individual experiences of it. Uh, now, of all the social identities, however, gender was one that the respondents were quite vocal about. Some observations were that planning was favored more by female students than by male students uh, when compared to other design or, uh, discipline, uh, design or science based disciplines. However, despite there being more female planning students than male, the conversion was not the same in the professional world where there were more male planners than female planners. And the respondents also spoke of the gendered preferences in, that could be seen in different planning practices in that more desk-based planning were done by female planners and field-based planning were done by male planners. Now coming to language, in the narratives of respondents at all sites, language emerged as an important part of their experience. Now when we speak about language, the sense that the respondents made in their storytelling allowed us to see how they look at and think of language. This was different from how we approached the concept of language in education and practice in terms of there being a regional or local language and there being a global language. So while some talked about the proficiency in a specific language to be considered a better planner, some also spoke of how plan they learned planning in one language but had to practice it in a completely different language. Some also spoke of how when speaking to residents for whom planning would be done, moving away from uh, uh, very specific or technical terms helped in better communicating the planning practices that would be adopted. Uh, moving to location, uh, the location of the respondents was also an important element. While some spoke of the importance of the city setup in studying and understanding planning, some talked about how the city structure provided them with a more real space of, of an urban region. And these were mostly respondents who came from suburban areas or tier two or tier three cities. 
some also spoke of how going to the city was their life goal at, as it was only the city that could provide them with the best of everything which also spoke about the centralized centralization of all services and education around planning right uh, now as one of the main aims of the study was to understand the impact our respondents education played on their practice analyzing the shifting subject positions of students and alumni members of the university provided us with some valuable insights now values of equity and equality is very difficult to teach because they are experiential while the institutes did have the element of social responsibility of a planner in their curriculum the translation of that learning into practice however was quite subjective now in these tables uh, each uh, left side talks about the imagined identity of a planner they had when they went into the course of planning and the right side speaks of the uh, kind of planner they ended up becoming and the reasons for it so while some spoke of how the profession failed to provide them with the opportunity to act on their values some also talked about how the professional setting was one that discouraged it some talked about how the kind of planning they studied was uh, not practiced or practiced in the areas they wanted to practice because planning as a process itself was very centralized in that it was only few areas that had that received all the resources from government and other areas did not uh in this particular section the respondent uh, they speak of how they identify more as a storyteller than a researcher and they don't think policy is always the response or uh, the solution for problems we face however they were also aware of the fact that if this is the mentality with which they went into the world of work they would become unemployable so in addition to the negotiations i'm so sorry uh, in so in addition to the negotiations that they made it was clear that despite being in a similar field all the respondents had very different reasons and trajectories for being there and for practicing in a certain way and this was informed by their experiences both personally and within the education institutes and with yeah the last two slides so now briefly coming to the challenges that our methodology faced so Uh, a lot of our so a lot of our respondents came from different ethnic cultural and geographical backgrounds and uh, so there were a lot of ethical concerns surrounding that practice especially in terms of how we de dealt with transcription because for none of our participants was english a first language but it was the only common language also a lot of our field work was done during covid so for us uh, so for a lot of our cases our site was moved from uh, in person to online and challenges around those were there and finally uh, since our respondents belonged to different uh, patriarchal and racial uh, backgrounds talking about these topics about experiences with gender race or ethnicity was also tricky to have so finally uh, the structured and linear imaginations of trajectories is a myth and we find through our participants narratives the messy linearities in which most students and practitioners of planning found themselves in and how that shaped their practice institution the, there are multiple and sometimes messy ways in which narratives spoke back to the neat structures of our inquiry there's also a disjuncture between how education is imparted and consumed and how that goes on to shape the practice of that education so through this paper and work we try to provide a direction for policies in education and practice to be mindful of which could enable better engagement at both levels of education and when those people receiving those education move on to the world of practice so policies that would inform uh, both and how like accounting for the experiential element can lead to better like imparting the same education better so that's it thank you thank you priya now we have the last presentation akhila p uh, from gulati institute of finance and taxation her topic is state and non state actors in higher education development a case of kerala Good afternoon, all. I'm Akhila. I'm from Gulati Institute of Finance and Taxation. The paper I'm going to present here is carved out from my its background chapter of my PhD thesis. Uh, it's on higher education development in Kerala. I'm doing my PhD at Centre for Development Studies, Trivandrum. Uh, 
so uh, the title of the paper is state and non state actors in higher education development a case of kerala so this paper is uh, presents kerala's higher education development policy ethos from 1900s to 2020 and we are trying to figure out a narrative of the state efforts to safeguard its regional and social equity in educational development so building on the framework on the theoretical framework on the role of state and non state actors in education development the paper address basically two purposes first it attempts to understand the process and phases of higher education development in kerala uh, by emphasizing the role of state and non state actors second it aims to address the non state basically focusing upon the non state engagement in higher education in sector in kerala so why we are focusing more on the non state Uh, sector in higher education sector in kerala because the privatization or the, the when we look at the higher education development in kerala we see we can see the prominence of the aided institutions in higher education sector so how this non state actors uh, evolved over different phases is some some something that excite excited me to look into my thesis which is the first chapter of my thesis so it is this paper is carved out from that it's a, it's an ongoing work uh, as part of this uh, to complete this paper i am also doing some stakeholder interviews it's uh, it's in the process it's not completed so the comments and comments are mostly welcome because it's in the very uh, it's in the <laughs> finals i am in the final stage of my thesis so it's where the comments are made much welcome so moving on to the presentation this is the structure of the presentation i will first of all i will set out the background by focusing on the how the higher education development happened in kerala then i will briefly discuss about the methodology and data then i will exp uh, we have uh, devised a framework uh, the framework we adopted from the global education monitoring report recently they released a report on non state actors in higher education sector we use that framework to understand the higher education development process in kerala then uh, we will discuss the what are the different phases of higher education development and finally we focus on more on the role of state and non state actors in higher education development and then conclude the study so globally uh, privatization policies have taken a lead role in higher education policy reforms often with the encouragement of the international financial institutions and in india privatization policies adopted after 1900s has created a paradigm shift in the higher education sector from a social democratic uh, from a social democratic institution holding democratic values to neo liberal institutions favoring competition with minimal state involvement when we look at the kerala higher education sector we can we can also see a uh, witness a radical transformation after 1990s the gross enrollment ratio in kerala sorry the gross enrollment ratio in kerala uh, which is estimated as 5.9 percentage in 1972-73 increased to 38.8 percent in 2019-20 uh, which was higher than the national average of 27 percent but in this way we can see the large number of new colleges opened were self financing operated by the non state actors and were offering courses like engineering medicines and management degree which are gradually uh, very much uh, very much uh, which very much demanded by the labor market so how were the nature of privatization observed in kerala higher education sector is different because of the significant presence of the aided higher education sector higher education institutions operated by the non state actors in kerala around 78 percentage of the higher education institutions uh, are aided institutions owned by non state actors who are caste and religious groups though these institutions Uh, were regulated by the state their accountability and transparency in the function still exist as a debatable issue the participation of the non state actors in the higher education development in kerala can be observed from 1900s it's uh, that's something that makes different it's not something that we can not uh, notice after 1990s it's something we can notice the present participation of non state actors in higher education even from the 1900s however uh, the non state engage their engagement in education has different motivations right from charity to profit making over the over the years they moved from periphery of the educational provision to the central position however it is essential to understand that non state actors in higher education particularly in educa higher education they are highly diverse and different across different countries therefore any discussion or analysis of the impact of non state actors ideally needs to include a classification of ownership management and how they are funded that is the financing resources 
also in the context of privatization happening in higher education sector it is it is also relevant to understand why what is the role of these non state actors whether they can be excluded or how they have to be in, in, included in the higher education development or what are the forms of regulations they need to be focused upon in uh, how 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 can we include these non state actors in the higher education development so in this context, this paper is an attempt to explain the process and phases of higher education development in Kerala by focusing on the role of state and non-state actors. So the data and methodology, the study is basically descriptive in nature. Firstly, we analyze different phases of higher education development using enrollment rates, private participation in enrollment and geographical distribution of educational institutions from 1900 to 2019. This was done on the basis of the report that uh, data from Travancore Administrative Reports, Educational Data from Directorate of Economics and Statistics and All India Higher Education Survey and NSSO 71st Round, Social Consumption and Education. And also we have done some stakeholder interviews of management associations, uh, KSHEC members and also uh, teachers and some students. The framework we are using is a non-state engagement in higher education put forward by Prachi Srivastava in Global Education, Global education Monitoring Report 2020-21. So mapping the role of state and non-state actors, actors in higher education can be broadly split into state actors and non-state actors. But however, the state actors always represent government or princely states functioning in a particular state. But a, an educational institution is considered to be state and state or public if it is controlled and managed by the state or national government. UNESCO considers an educational institution to be non-state if it is country it's if it is controlled or managed by an NGO or if it has a governing body that primarily consists of members not selected by a public agency. But however, this distinction between state and non-state actors is often blur. So we cannot make a clear distinction like this institution is public, this operated by state actors or this institution is operated by non-state actors because of the motives with this institution's function. So uh, I'm not... Uh, in this, in, in this paper, we are not making a clear cut uh, difference between these are the non-state and these are the state actors, but there are, we can, we, we, we need to make a distinction, often but we need to make a distinction because of their changing motives over the phases of higher education development. So, uh, what are the domains of operations of this uh, non-state actors in higher education development or the state actors? First one is the provision, second one is the financing, and third one is the regulation, and fourth one is management. But uh, for the analysis, we are basically focusing on the first three, that is provision, financing, and regulation. So this is the framework we adopted from the GEM report for analyzing the role of actors in higher education. In provision, we know that if, uh, the educational institutions are mostly focusing upon the core, providing core educational services, and they also providing learning related support, support services and other support services and goods. So when it comes to government aided institutions, uh, this provision is basically focusing upon educational infrastructure and opening up of educational institutions in all levels of education. And also when it comes to learning related and support support services, introduction of STEM subjects and courses and also when it comes to learning related service we can see that many we can see the introduction of add-on courses and self financing courses in many aided colleges in Kerala. When it comes to government unaided institu government unaided institution in the in terms of provision, we can see they also focused upon building up the infrastructure, market oriented courses, focusing on the technical and management e education, and also they are focused on the self financing co self financing courses, campus placement, and curriculum development. When it comes to financing, government aided institutions are basically financed by gra grant in aid subsidies, and also some household expenditures are also involved in it. When it comes to unaided institutions, they are private investment and basically depending upon the household expenditure. When it comes to governance, regulations, uh, government aided institutions are, reg are regulated to some forms of acts. When it comes to una unaided institutions, some forms of regulations are there, but it is limited and it's only minimal regulation. So these are the basic, basically three, uh, three types of higher education institution based on ownership, management and financing arrangement in Kerala. And so moving on to the analysis part, it's the first phase of higher education development in Kerala. For the, uh, we have identified basically three phases of higher education development. First phase is the period of slow growth, that is from 1900s to 1950s. Second is the phase of expansion phase, that is from 1950s to 1980s. And third is the 
massification phase that is from 1980s to 2019. So in the first phase, the period of slow growth, we can see that higher education expansion was predom predominantly associated with princely states. Generally, the possible factors that which were identified, which motivated the beginning of educational development du during this period are the progressive policies followed by the princely rulers, the effort of Protestant Christian missionaries, the role played by various social religious organizations, radical political movements and resulting socio-economic changes. Why I have put the progressive policies in the red column? It's, <laughs> it's, uh, we need we over the over the course of analysis we will we'll understand whether the pro, the policies are progressive or not so at the beginning of 1900s is considered as a rising era of modern education in kerala but the growth occurred in slow pace that's why we put it as a period of slow growth because of the rigidity in the policies followed by the princely states in the 19th century in this period only 21 colleges that's 21 higher education institution were established and among them 43 percent in the government sector that's in the public sector and remaining 57 percent under the control of the non-state actors <laughs> imagine that is during the period first phase 1900s to 1950s this institutions of higher learning that existed until the second half of the 19th century were under the control of non-state actors who were religious groups why these religious groups emerged during that period is like uh, when uh, even though the progressive policy as a result of the pro policies followed by the princely rulers they encouraged the higher education parties higher education among the oh, um, uh, among the uh, among people but they the higher education was mostly restricted to higher sections of the society they largely restricted the participation of the largely restricted the participation of the uh, scheduled caste and are also uh, lower, lower, lower section of the society. Yeah, yeah. So if you can focus on the actual analysis rather yeah. than on the details. So uh, the movie, so it's the exclude. We can see the exclusionary nature of higher education. That's already happened in the sl uh, even the first phase of the higher education development because uh, even the po policies followed by the princely uh, princely rulers they denied the co-education. They even started special schools for the women and also for the special educational institutions for the uh, uh, for the uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe students and even for the. Uh, other marginalized sections of the society. When it comes to the period of expansion, this period showed an unprecedented expansion of higher education in Kerala in terms of provision, an increase in number of educational institutions, enrollment rates, and many stringent policy measures confined to the participation of non-state actors can be observed during this period. So after 1950s, total number of colleges increased substantially. Between 1950 to 68, 19 new colleges were started, and among them, 87% were in the private sector. So when uh, this graph clearly shows the period of during this period also, from 1970 to, uh, 1972 to 83, 22 government colleges were opened and most of them were among the educationally backward districts of Kerala. And we can see the higher enrollment, uh, higher enrollment in terms uh, in ter when we compare to the slow pace. When it comes to the period of massification, this phase is marked by an unprecedented expansion in higher education with large number of higher education institutions and enrollment ratios. And uh, in the state, there were 1,280 1, higher educational institutions. Among them, 19.3% constitute government higher education institutions, whereas 15.94% are private aided institutions and 64% are private unaided institutions. So the, uh, when we see the SCST enrollment in higher education in 2019-20, it's, uh, it's uh, it's 12.72 percent and 1.85 percent. So this uh, table shows the period of massification. So what's the stage of higher enrollment, gross enrollment ratio in India and Kerala? So moving on to the role of actors. So uh, when we look into the provision of higher education in the first phase, we can see the main providers are the princely states, Christian missionaries, and British East India Company. But we can see the unequal distribution of higher education institutions across and different provinces during this period. In Kerala, we have uh, Travancore, Cochin, and uh, Malabar. And three in these three different regions, the provisions the provisions in terms of higher education institutions are very diverse. In Travancore, we can see large number of higher education institution it is because of the policies devised by the princely rulers but it when, when it comes to Cochin and Malaba uh, we cannot see uh, the number of higher educational institutions are lesser uh, it's it's not it's because of the uh, uh, Malabar it's because of the educational backwardness already existing in the population during that time in Cochin it's because of the um, 
presence of certain kinds of caste and religious groups. So, and also they denied the co-education and special education system, uh, institutions were opened for the marginalized sections of the uh, sections of the society. And also we can see the low, enro low enrollment of females in STEM subjects even from, uh, even in first phase. That is, in or, or, though the special education institu institutions were opened for the females, they were last, largely encouraged to, to uh, pursue courses like swing, home, uh, home science courses, needle, like such kind of courses. They are not encouraged to engage in these STEM subjects. So when it comes to uh, we will discuss if we have anything, we will discuss it during the discussion. When it comes to finance, sorry, uh, when it comes to expansion phase, we can see the predominance of non-state characters can be seen in the number of educational institutions open, also in terms of enrollment rate. So rather than institution run by Christian missionaries, three major caste groups such as Nair Service Society, NSS, SNDP and Muslim Education Society started their higher educational institutions during this phase. When Nair Naya Service Society focused the educational advancement of the upper caste Hindus. SNDP prioritized education for Iravas and MES focused on the educational upliftment of the Muslim community. These groups opened up competition in establishing new colleges, both in technical and non-technical courses. They had explicit religious curriculum and scheduled in their function. So, the, so uh, and they also moved with the argument of minority protection during this phase and the state decision to give private registration to candidates to appear for university examination per the way for the mushrooming of parallel colleges in the state, which is one of the important, important steps that mark the expansion phase in the higher education provision. But these parallel colleges were operated without government regulation and made a quick and huge profit by popularizing private demand for higher education. So in the massification phase, the non-state engagement and their character show a tremendous change compared to the other two phases. There's a, that's a, the first important policy is the policy of allowing self-financing colleges in the state. And this has led to an unprecedented increase in private participation in both general and technical education in the higher education sector. Many institutions introduced new and, new and market-friendly courses which help to generate higher fees from students. But meantime, be, uh, by 2018-19, many of these new self-financing colleges are, are in the face of closure and we can see the vacant colleges in the engineering college engineering colleges in the states and also we can see the migration of students is one of the most important fa important uh, important issue during this phase in the massification phase when it comes to finance we can see that in the first phase uh, the educational finance is mostly through the grandinates and subsidies uh, that is uh, Princely, princely state also, they, they are giving subsidies and grants for the uh, non-state actors to open up the educational institution. And also, it also depend upon the um, household household income. That's uh, like, it said that the collection of monthly subscription from the households of the students in both cash and kind was present during that time. So the value of such saving was calculated to be roughly, to, roughly equal to 5% of the consumption expenditure of the families. And in, when it comes to expansion phase, the grand in aid system was brought under systematic review and government of the time, that time introduced direct payment system through which government took responsibility for salary and pension payment to the staff and uh, staff of the aided institution. So the 50% of seats reserved under management quota and 20% of seats were reserved for the SC and ST students and unaided students however are privately funded and students fees were considered as the most crucial source of income by these institutions. So in the expansion phase, uh, the public investment in uh, higher education has, uh, has reduced and the share of education, higher education come down from 27.4 percentage to 2.41 percentage in 2020-21. So we can imagine how much share the household has to bear for the higher education sector in Kerala and also for the, in the, high, in the unaided and aided institutions in higher education sector. So when it comes to the last last point, that's the regulation. There are though there are many regulations right from the we can see in the period of slow growth in the expansion phase and massification phase. When we see to the function of the non-state actors, we can see that none of these regulations has had not made any uh, any considerable change in their. Uh, 
in their action and also uh, over the time from slow growth to massification phase these non state actors they emerged as a pressure group and they started to pressurize the state go the state uh, in order to uh, uh, in order to bring about it uh, they cannot make a radical change by excluding the non state actors in higher education now because they this caste and religious groups they emerged as a very prominent non state actor actors in higher education sector in kerala though there are many regulations so how they function in and basically in the expansion phase uh, through the care <coughs> through the direct payment system act and all government try to state try to control this uh, control the activities of the non state actors in higher education but uh, they emerged as a pressure groups they protested uh, against the government by shutting down the educational institutions so they um, so the government is compelled to withdraw all the regulations they put on the uh, non state sectors that is the aided higher education institutions in kerala so as a conclusion we can see that higher education sector in kerala we can uh, we can see from a slow growth to massification phase and their influence is felt from the slow growth to massification stage as evident in terms of number of institutions and enrollment patterns initially the non state engagement in higher education was in the form of sharing the cost with the state state or the government in the next phase that is in the expansion phase so the emergence of parallel colleges self financing institutions and capitation fee institution and in most recent phase we have seen struggles around the autonomy of private educational institutions and establishment of private universities in kerala non state actors are a core part of the sector's educational service as well as ancillary service including both independently and also with the support of the state so the core education service and learning related support provided by these actors has considerably increased the participation of students in higher education sector I, in the early phase the motive of the non state actors was to popularize education among the marginalized and poor sections but in later stage they were reluctant to follow the even the reservation policies in student and staff intake with consequent effects on the kerala society thank you Thank you, Akila. Now we are open for question and answers. Now this arrangement will have to. Since the all the four people cannot come here, it seems that we don't have enough space. We'll just regulate the mic, sir. Sorry. We'll regulate the mic, sir. No, no, that I know. Okay. Present. Yeah, I would suggest that presenters come here, all four, so that mm. they will speak from here. Or we bring a few more chairs here. I uh, yeah. that wouldn't be feasible. Okay. I think the presenters. So I would suggest all the four presenters to come in the first row here. And now we will open for questions. I would request uh, uh, the people who ask questions to mention to whom they are asking the question. If this is not a general uh, sort of question. that makes three presentations actually there were four uh, yeah she is coming yeah no no she is coming yeah thank you yeah thank you i have no, i have no question i have want to make a, three, a clarifications since me some of them are phd thesis one your, your mic your mic uh, one clarification is that you know i think there are two terms which are used in the presentations not by one person one is privatization the other one is the non state actors mm -hmm. i think one should be careful in a thesis when you use using mm -hmm. privatization is very different from growth of private sector privatization is a process whereby public institutions are operating on the basis of the market principles so in a thesis when you are using if it comes for evaluation this will be the issues of conceptual clarity so that is one part non state actor is a very good term that is being used more commonly used mm. because within the private sector one has to make a distinction between for profit sector and not for profit sector these are the three four categories so since this was used not in one presentation in another presentation so that's why i'm saying that i don't expect any answer a clarification a second conceptual clarification this is more related to the presentation based on jarkan see gross enrollment ratio cannot be used as a reliable indicator of educational development and if you are talking about school education it should be net enrollment ratio because what is in the denominator and what is in the numerator 
takes into account the age factor. If you are talking about primary education, 6 to 11 age group children in the school divided by 6 to 11 age group people multiplied by 100, you know. So that makes net enrollment ratio. So if you want to talk about the progress, say for example, when a, when a, 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 an area where there was no school, in especially in the region, you know, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Orissa, etc., when a new school is opened, you find that children with age group 7, 8, etc., will be coming. So you will find that GR is 125. So, but that doesn't mean that that is more developed than a state where education is developed and the uh, uh, GR is 100 or 102. So, when the GR comes closer to 100, that is the stage where you find that the progress is taking place if you see over a period of time. That's the second clarification that I wanted to say. Yeah, another one is that when somebody says that there are 250 students in a school, I doubt very much how rural that uh, school is. See, I have visited so many places and so uh, conducted surveys, but I don't find such big schools in the remote rural areas. One should be careful. I think uh, the impression that was given in the presentation is that it's a very remote rural area. But the uh, number of the students that is given and the size of the school does not justify that, you know. The, a third point is that uh, I, would I like to see that, you know, these phases of expansion that is used in the last paper, you know, just Akila, that you presented. See, once we are talking about the term massification, it's a technical term. It is not a common term. We have to go for Martin Ross definition of 1973 or 100, uh, 2006. And that is based on enrollment ratios. Unless you have defined your criteria to say that, say for example, your second phase is phase of expansion. And the third phase is phase of massification. There is no difference between the two, unless you bring out something. Unless you relate this with the GR. If the GR exceeds 15%, then you call it massification. If the GR exceeds 50%, then you call it is a stage of universalization. And if the GR is less than 15%, it's an elite stage of expansion. So these are the classical uh, definitions that are accepted, conceptually accepted ones. So if you are using for a thesis, since you are you said that uh, you had little more time to do the thesis. So you tried to rearrange uh, this on a set of uh, a set of criteria, you know. I mean, that is uh, very, very, very important, you know. So the phase of massification is very important and try to see that, you know. And uh, the phenomenon of parallel colleges that you mentioned. See, that is a very different type of arrangement that you're talking about in parallel. Uh, that is not existing in many other states and perhaps you know, not in, in many places in the world even, you know. That's a different phenomenon of expansion. And one of the reasons for the expansion is that earlier there was a uh, condition that unless you have 45% of marks for admission, neither aided colleges nor unaided colleges, even in the management quota, you can be admitted. But parallel colleges gave an uh, impression that if you, uh, if you want to, if even if you have only 35%, if you are a past student, you could admit. So, who are the people who went to the parallel colleges? These are the people who went to, who did not have the 45%. At the same time, the fees were not very high. So, it is very different private sector that you are operating. It is almost like uh, the low cost school systems, you know, private school systems that are operating. So, that should not be clubbed with uh, the private sector. Conceptually, these are important. Sorry, I just wanted to make these points because all these are conceptual issues and if you are uh, working on the thesis, these are very, very important issues. You know, when you go for a lecture, this may not be important, but when your <laughs> thesis to be evaluated, these are very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vargas. Uh, he gave four clarifications, which I believe would be useful to you, but he also asked a question, sort of, like, uh, whether the, the, the school in which there are 250 students is actually a rural school. So maybe that could be remote, remote rural school, whether that is a remote rural school. Maybe you can answer that little thing and then we can go to the next question. And please do take the question. Yeah, that's right. You want to answer, Akila? Oh, that was to uh, Bhavna. Uh, I was thinking that it won't, Kerala, why are you asking this? So, yeah. For Jharkhand, it is relevant. Yeah. 
Yeah, sir, I'm under the impression that it was a remote school. If you can tell me what uh, remote school entails, what's the definition of it? Okay, I will, uh, I'll come in. See, what I think uh, uh, Professor Varghese is trying to say, that, I mean, it's not a definition issue, but in, in, in a tribal area, as we know across the country, in a tribal area, a remote rural school cannot have 250 uh, students. And that's something that's valid. All of us who have done. So he's pointing out to that inconsistency that remote rural areas, are, uh, re remote rural tribal areas are always very small habitations with a small population. And that's why we have different norms of opening the school. So what you are describing as remote rural seems inconsistent with our understanding of actual remote rural tribal area. And the existing data, it's not only our understanding. Our understanding is based on existing data. So that's what his question. Okay, so she, I mean, she's saying I'll note it. So, so we'll leave it. Yeah. Hmm. Other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, it's not a question, but just a clarification. And it can be for all the papers, uh, it's not one only the last one. Uh, so it's now open for all four papers yeah. that were presented. Yeah. Uh, the Neha in a slide used the word called thick uh, descriptions. So just uh, as a no clarification about that, uh, she can throw a clarification. She can throw a clarification yeah. about it. Yes. Thick description. Huh. So thick and thin. Uh, I'll respond. Please. Yeah. So uh, thick description is a method that we use in qualitative research mainly. And it is to do with observations and ethnographic practices that we follow. So it's a way of writing really re rich and detailed notes of your observations, of your reflections, everything. So that's why we call it thick description. As against <laughs> thin description. Yeah. <laughs> So I will ask uh, uh, Rohit to ask his questions if nobody else is. But I also had one or two things. One for Akila, I actually thought that, uh, mm, I mean, he has talked about massification. But also, see, Kerala, uh, it's, it makes it much more interesting when you look at a subnational level in the context of the nation. So even if your thesis, you know, I, I'm sure this is a background chapter and it won't. But still, you know, the questions asked should be of different kind, I feel, that even in a descriptive chapter. Uh, for example, see, Kerala had very different school completion rates, literacy rates, as compared to the rest of the country in 60s, 70s, 80s. And actually, if you look at the higher education, uh, those were not as different as compared to school education. So one of the things that in 80s and 90s people have raised and people have written about uh, uh, is that why that, you know, why Kerala's school uh, uh, education expansion did not impact, did not create a demand for higher education which led to the growth of higher education, which would be seen as proportionate and similar kind of trajectory that most places one sees. So, you know, those are the kinds of questions that one should answer when you are writing these. So uh, the literature will give you those. If you, if you look at literature, literature will give you those cues that, that what uh, you should be answering. And I had one question, because that I thought was something, you said there is no, no difference between state and non-state. So that, you, you made one statement very clearly. I don't know if anyone else noticed, so I, uh, which was you said that the definitions are such that you, uh, you noticed, uh, uh, yeah, Pushkarni, see, 
so uh, that there's no difference you know the you know the who to call state and what to call so i was wondering why do you said that hello I, it's not i am not making that this i am not telling that there is no distinction i mean i am telling that that distinction is very blurred the state why, and why non state so? it's because so? uh, when we see the a presence of aided institutions in kerala that's bas basically in that context i said it's blurred because aided institutions in uh, as, as as i discussed uh, they are um, all, almost uh, except admission process and management everything else else, else is uh, supported by the government in terms of granting aid and other uh, other kind in terms of minority protection and in terms of <coughs> inclusion of the scheduled caste or scheduled tribes or marginalized section so so in the literature it is uh, it's itself it's mentioning that we cannot make a clear distinction between state actors and non state actors and it's often blurred in all countries context it's that it's literature that's mentioning i ha huh. i did not get time to explain when you are saying that non state actors hmm. see in the non state actors there are three categories one is the aided sector other is the unaided self financing sector and third one is the parallel colleges these are the three sectors the operation uh, arrangements for all these sectors are very different aided sector cannot increase fees beyond a point because they are getting 95% of their gra uh, finances grants from the government only the maintenance grant is not given otherwise salaries all of these things are protected and moreover the salary that is given to the teachers professors etc should be at par with what is given by the government you know so there are conditionalities put and the finances are given so it is in terms of fees and other arrangements you will find that it's not that is only applicable to the aided sector not applicable to the financing sector if you look into more closely into the data ever since the self financing sector became very active what you find is that in many of the mahalwang and the university or kerala university or calicut university in all the places the government college universities and colleges many of the physics chemistry seats are lying vacant because the students are driving in driven away to management courses or to engineering courses or to dental courses and other courses you know so this is a phenomenon that is taking place even when the fees levels are very low the students are not ready to come so it is not a question of cost you know this is a different phenomenon which you do not find because you find in other parts of the country that is where what uh, she mentioned about the need for a national perspective <coughs> is very important in other places that is not the case the seats are not available here the available seats are lying vacant because of the influence of the private sector you know that is very important yes sangeet Akila again, um, because of Kerala, being from Kerala also, um, I just wanted to understand because we hear a lot of the role of the Communist Party in Kerala and West Bengal, and their role in education. And uh, you know, I wanted to know what was the role played by the party in terms of higher education? Or was there was it mainly you know uh, in in schools? And uh, the second thing in terms of you know what you said about women being channeled into certain um occupations i felt if you could give us a little more information about say nursing which became such a predominant you know uh sector and multiple colleges on nursing so that didn't play out but is that something that you saw a lot of and is there an active encouragement of um private sector or public sector focus on you know nursing right Hello, ma. Uh, thank you for the question. First question, I, I as a, a presenter, uh, when we see the role of communist party, that's the left government role, role of left government in educational expansion. That's something that we we, we cannot uh, over, we cannot deny their role because in the first phase, that is in the slow phase, that is the first period of uh, slow growth. We can see that after 1950s, uh, because of the uh, many of the policies initiated by the uh, communist party of India during that time, communist party of India was ruling that uh, ruling. So because of many policies initiated by them only there are large number of educational institutions started in the uh, Cochin and Malabar where there are less number of educational institutions and also because of the many policies uh, that's mainly we, we need to we 
at, at that time itself we need to uh, remember the importance of the um, like pols uh, 1956 policy regulations they through it is only the communist government who put who put introduced that regulation they tried to regulate the non state actors there is a aided institution caste and religious groups but as as i mentioned they act <laughs> this institution acted as a pressure pressure groups they put pressure on the government still uh, in the recommendations and in, in in terms of committee reports there are many recommendations are coming to regulate these institutions but it's still in the as a, <laughs> as i all know it's still in being and second question coming to the enrollment of women in the first phase even the princely states and also the state uh, the state state government they were more mostly encouraged the women participation in other not other traditional subjects that women are drawn to swing home science like but it went when it comes to the later stage at after 1900s they gradually shifted towards the market oriented courses for example nursing but we can see the large number of nursing colleges are operated in the non state that is in the uh, pri private college private sector because it's something uh, that uh, it is I, I, in the policies itself it's mentioning that we we, we need to find only less number of um, uh, nursing colleges in the uh, public sector but a large number of uh, higher education institution in terms of nursing and also paramedical courses not only nursing paramedical courses we can find uh, the enrollment of uh, females it's very higher in the la later stage in the thank uh, you akila so we will now ask uh, rohit has a few questions so we will go to go there no uh, i don't have few i have only two suggestions questions it's not necessary for you to respond to them uh, but okay in the first uh, presentation uh, it's very rich description that's true but it seems to me that the conceptual analysis regarding uh, how does that or how how the public good comes into it uh, that doesn't seem to be very clear or maybe it doesn't seem to be clear to me i would suggest that a little bit more um, analysis is needed there uh, that's how it 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 looked to me second thing is that Uh, there are certain <coughs> concepts which are descriptive concepts and on the what you see on the ground you might have to change the concept there are certain concepts which are you know sit in between they are descriptive as well as analytical used to understand a phenomena they don't necessarily change uh, on the basis of the ground level situation i am not certain you know, sna can inform us better but it seems to me that the public good uh, concept seems to be descriptive originally in the sense of you know certain economic phenomena when you are using it uh, overall you know available amenities in the society then every single sector what you see on the basis of that changing its definition uh, it it will lose its analytical power actually because uh, it it seems that public good in education means this and in that means this so it this seems to be difficult to connect these two things that since you so a different kind of phenomena therefore public good definition has to be changed according to that uh, third thing is a little bit out of the sink in today's thinking uh, critical pedagogy and all all these things are well very fine how do we distinguish between critical pedagogy and indoctrination suppose suppose someone says why are you saying that fair is not beautiful you see one is that in the society generally we came to a level of consciousness where the beauty is not seen uh, only in fairness and therefore we want to communicate this idea to the children and second is that we want the children to understand the what what aesthetic means and what beauty means and its relative nature from that point of view students in the upper uh, upper secondary etc can deal with these questions about knowledge and identity uh, uh, the idea of relationship between fair and 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 beauty uh, relationship between knowledge and caste they are actually very nuanced and complex ideas uh, hope we are not 
indoctrinating in communicating these ideas prematurely to students who may not be able to make much sense of them. That's just a caution. And, and this is a caution which many of my friends would uh, don't think is a very good idea to even caution in that, because these are the ideas we should take to the field. That's how generally it is thought. Your friends may also be responsible people. I'll respond. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and they, know, they may not be just doing like that. You know, yeah. this is a news that my friends are also responsible people, but uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, one sitting next to me. <laughs> no, no, these friends. Now, that, uh, I have only one more little uh, thing. Uh, just one second. Yeah, but also this... Uh, I found this, this description of Rubin and how he is dealing with the situation uh, fascinating. And it has a lot in it. But again, this stops at the level of description. It seems to me that it requires analysis, uh, perhaps from more than one perspective, and uh, not, not jumping at the conclusions. Uh, one can see it as a limitation as well as the grounded understanding of the child that he is aware of his situation, how much he can study and how much he cannot study. You see, there has to be a kind of nuanced argument about uh, that what are the problems in a child of that age having this idea? Would you consider it uh, a a, a, a mature understanding of the ground level situation or would you consider it frustrating a child's aspiration and what are the grounds for that? I think that kind of uh, analysis should go on a little bit more on that. Mm -hmm. Now, thank you very much. These are the only two comments. They are not directly any questions, just comments on that. Mm, okay. So, uh, you want to say something to Priya? That uh, planning course, you don't have a comment? No. Planning. I think to, to some extent, perhaps what you uh, told Bhavna, that may perhaps apply to her as well, in, in terms of taking the analysis further and making connections. Yeah. So I will not, I mean, uh, some of the things that I, I feel provoked to respond, but that I'll do, uh, <laughs> since also time is, is an issue, I won't do it here. Um, no, and not because of this, but also because of, you know, the things that uh, I have worked on with that age group uh, uh, much more intensely and then therefore uh, from that perspective, but this is perhaps not the time. But uh, so this is just to register that the difference of opinion. Yeah. So. Uh, um, with that, should we close? Because I think it's 2 o'clock. 